All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to today's UC Ag Expert Talk. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM program. Cheryl Reynolds is also here with us to run the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environment. Okay, so with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Mark Hoddle is an extension and biological control specialist at UC Riverside. He is also the director of the Center for Invasive Species Research. Today, he is speaking about the biology and management of avocado lace bug in California. And now I'd like to pass this over to Mark. Mark, you can go ahead and share your slides. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Okay, um, as Stephanie mentioned, the title of today's presentation is The Biology and Management of Avocado Lace Bug in California. This is a pest that first showed up in California around 2004, but uh, maybe over the last three, four years or so, it's recently reared up and become problematic again. Uh, hence, there's a lot of interest in managing this insect and knowing more about its biology, particularly in commercial avocado growing areas in the Temecula Fallbrook Ocean Side area, where it's becoming uh, a, a bigger nuisance for a lot of growers down there. Uh, you can see three photographs in this title slide. The photograph on the left shows some lace bug damage to uh, some uh, avocado leaves. I think these were on uh, bacon trees down in San Diego. You can see some adult lace bugs sitting here with their um, egg masses. And one of the natural enemies that appears to be somewhat effective, but not a great natural enemy of avocado lace bugs are these uh, lace wing larvae. We're gonna be covering aspects of all of these um, attributes for these natural enemies and the pest biology today. So what are we going to go over? We'll talk a bit about the biology of the avocado lace bug, the damage that it causes to the leaves, and where it's distributed throughout California and in larger parts of the world, especially through Mexico, the Caribbean, and we'll touch a little bit on the recent invasion into Hawaii as well. We'll cover the first invasion into California, which happened down in the urban areas of San Diego County around Chula Vista and National City. And then we'll go over some old work that we did that was sponsored by the California Avocado Commission. And this was the initial response to detecting this pest in Southern California. Uh, working with Joe Morse, whom some of you may remember, he's been retired for a few years now. Uh, we ran some phenology studies down there. We looked at some natural enemy and insecticide evaluations for controlling avocado lace bug, and we'll discuss some of those results. And then we're going to move into a new area that we've been uh, sort of dabbling in, but haven't done too much work in. Uh, this is what we have determined to be a second invasion into California. And these are populations of avocado lace bugs that have established in commercial Hass avocado orchards in the Fallbrook, Bonzel and Oceanside area. And we'll go over some of the molecular work that helped us determine that this was a new invasion that occurred independently to the one that had originally occurred back in San Diego County. So a little bit of an overview of avocado lace bug biology and taxonomy. Its scientific name is Pseudoxista persiae. That's a hemipteran. That means it's a, a sap sucking bug. So the adults and nymphs have these needle like mouth parts that they use to pierce the leaf tissue. And once they've driven that needle-like mouth part into the uh, plant material, they then extract the chlorophyll. And this results in that characteristic bronzing patterns that you see on heavily damaged leaves that have been um, fed upon by the adult uh, lace bugs and, and the nymphs. Interestingly, this species was first described from specimens that were collected from avocados in Florida way back in 1908. It was originally placed in the genus Axista, but then a revision not long after the initial species description raised this new genus, Pseudaxista. And this is the only representative uh, lace bug species in that genus. So it's a monotypic genus. So back in 2004, we first detected avocado lace bug in um, National City. These were backyard avocado trees that were growing. Actually, I think it was a master gardener who first alerted us to this problem. He had several varieties of avocados growing in his backyard and noticed a strange damage to the leaves. And we went down and had a look. Dave Kellum was the uh, San Diego Ag Commissioner's uh, entomologist at the time. 
Guy Whitney's was, was still with the Avocado Commission and um, we went down and we had a look, collected some material and realized that this was potentially a serious problem based on what we knew about avocado lace bug activity in Florida and parts of the Caribbean. Then interestingly, late in 2017, I started getting phone calls and emails from people saying that uh, the lace bug had shown up in the Fallbrook, Bonsville, Oceanside area. And then I got a call from uh, some residents out in Culver City claiming that avocado lace bug had shown up there as well. I was a bit skeptical. <laughs> we hadn't seen avocado lace bug for about 13 years and suddenly it was like popping up all over the place from Fallbrook all the way through to Culver City in LA County. So sure enough, we went out um, with Enrico Ferro, a couple of other PCAs, got hold of those uh, homeowners that had called me, visited their properties. And sure enough, it was avocado lace bug and we started collecting adults, which we uh, used for some of the molecular work that I'll discuss a little bit later. So it was really curious to me, you know, why was there a 13 year lag from the initial detections in 2014 and then these outbreaks in 2017? And it's like, what, what had been going on for that intervening 13 years and we we really don't have an answer to that so the, the biology of these insects is really pretty simple the adults and nymphs they live on the undersides of the leaves and they feed on the undersides of the leaves so they pretty much spend their whole lives standing upside down on the undersides of the leaves feeding mating and laying eggs and it's this feeding damage with those needle-like mouth parts that causes damage to the leaves and it's been suggested that this feeding damage may also open up uh, entry ways or pathways for, um, I'm not exactly sure if you'd call them plant pathogenic fungi, but certainly fungi that can cause extra damage to the leaves that provides the openings for the fungi to get in. And we'll have a look at that in a few, few slides later. So all the host plants are apparently restricted to the Lauraceae. So avocado lace bug has been recorded feeding on avocados, camphor and red bay laurel. So all of these host plants seem to be within the Lauraceae was suggesting that this insect may be a specialist on plants that are within this family. So what do we know about avocado lace bug? Well, for such a widespread, obvious problematic insect, we, rel we know relatively little about the biology and behavior, ecology of, of this insect, even the natural enemies that attack it, we don't seem to know a lot about it. So it's been reported as a sporadic pest from Florida for a very long time. And as you may recall, it was first described from Florida back in 1908, probably because somebody noticed it was damaging avocados down there. Given the sporadic nature of the outbreaks that uh, avocado growers experience in Florida, it's been suggested that maybe the application of insecticides may disrupt the biological control agents, which allows localized flare-ups of these pest populations. Some foreign exploration work I did back uh, in the Caribbean with uh, Phil Phillips. Uh, he was a um, IPM area-wide advisor up in Ventura County. It left no doubt in our minds that this was a major insect pest of Hass avocados that were commercially grown in the Dominican Republic. We observed huge populations of Puerto Rico as well, and very high levels of uh, damage to avocados in, in Jamaica. And interestingly, Hass avocados were highly preferred in these areas. Some of the earlier literature had suggested that Hass avocados were not a particularly uh, favored cultivar for this pest. But I think um, the field work that we did throughout the Caribbean and the observations that we're making now in the Fallbrook, Bonzel, Oceanside area suggest that Hass avocados are just fine for this insect. Originally, when we started working on this pest back in 2004, we couldn't get them to live on av Hass avocados. We had to use bacon and bacon, the bacon variety was a very good host for avocado lace bug. So this feeds sort of back into what we are thinking is actually supporting data that we've had a second invasion of a different genotype of this pest into California. So I'll show you some data, some phenology data that we collected in San Diego back in 2004. The outbreaks typically occur during hot dry periods and now is the time when lace bug populations will begin building out in the orchards and potentially in people's backyards as well. So avocado varieties may vary in their susceptibility to attack. We haven't really systematically looked at this. As I mentioned earlier, originally bacon was a highly preferred uh, avocado variety for the initial 2004 invasion. In the 2017 invasion, Hass avocados are, are, are very strongly attacked by this pest. 
And the work Phil Phillips and I did through the Caribbean also supported that Hass avocados can support huge populations of avocado lace bugs. It's also been suggested that heavy attacks may reduce fruit yields on trees due to defoliation that can occur. Uh, we observed this in San Diego when the initial outbreaks occurred and fruit may also be damaged because of sunburn because there is no canopy now to protect developing fruit from the hot California sun. So this is a map that the CDFA and the USDA put together. And this map shows the distribution of avocado lace bug back in 2004, when we were dealing with the initial invasion. And you can see that these uh, magenta and red circles are pretty much restricted to the southern part of San Diego County. And the lace bug never really moved out of that area. So after working on this pest for a couple of years, it was decided that it really wasn't going to be a problem. And there was no evidence that it was advancing out of this initial zone of infestation and all work on this pest pretty much uh, stopped. This photograph shows some of the damage that we were observing in backyards. I think this was a bacon avocado and you can see the feeding damage caused by the avocado lace bug adults and nymphs of these leaves is extremely extensive. And it's also highly characteristic and it can sometimes be confused with salt burn I'm going to show you some photographs of that in a minute, but typically almost always avocado lace bug dam feeding damage is located to the central areas of the leaf. Tip burn that's caused by salty water tends to accumulate, as its name would suggest, in the tips of the avocado leaves. Here's a close up of some of that feeding damage in the mid region of this avocado leaf. And you can see that I've circled here in red the outlines here of some of these necrotic islands. And it's being suggested that feeding damage by avocado lace bug adults and nymphs may be amplified by pathogenic fungi, possibly these Coletotrichum species. So there's a suggestion in the literature that the avocado leaf, once it's damaged, those feeding wounds may allow entry for these pathogens to get in, which then cause these necrotic islands, which would not be there apparently if the fungi hadn't got in. Instead, you'd see this bronzing or stippling just caused by the avocado lace bug feeding. Remember, its mouth part is like a needle, so it's piercing these chlorophyll cells and extracting the chlorophyll and other carbohydrate resources that it needs from those cells that it punctures with its mouth parts. So tip burn and avocado leaf feeding damage is sometimes confused. This photograph on the left shows typical leaf burn on an avocado leaf. It's quite common in a lot of Southern California orchards due to the salt content of the water that's used for irrigating the uh, trees. And in comparison, avocado lace bug feeding damage tends to be more centrally located on the leaf. And you can see here, I've circled it in with this white circle and you can see that it's located in the central part of the leaf. It's in between these leaf veins and hard up against the leaf midrib here. Okay, so we'll move into some basic uh, biology now of avocado lace bug. This photograph shows a bunch of adults sitting around what looks to be like black streaks on the leaf. Well, these black looking streaks are actually the eggs of the avocado lace bug. And underneath that black tar-like substance that you see there that gives them that streaky look are the individual eggs. So occasionally the eggs will be laid, but the avocado lace bug females won't cover their eggs with a sticky tar-like material, but often they will cover it with this protective material. And we're not really sure what the function of this stuff is. It may be to reduce uh, desiccation rates of the eggs. Maybe it provides some sort of protection from uh, parasito egg parasitoids, maybe predators, maybe it camouflages the eggs so the natural enemies just don't realize that there's a potential food source there. And we're not really sure what the chemical makeup is of this black tar, but it's probably something that's excreted by the females after they've laid down the eggs, they come back and cover the egg masses or the individual eggs to make like this egg mass that's covered with this sticky tar-like material. Once the, here you can see some individual eggs, these little um, almost like black pearl like things that you see sitting on the leaf here, they haven't hatched. When they hatch, you can see where the operculum is and there's a small exit hole. So these eggs have not hatched. And here you can see some of the avocado lace bug nymphs. So as you recall, lace bugs are hemipterans and hemipterans exhibit hemimetabolous development. 
That means that when they hatch out of the egg, they look like miniature adults. And each time they molt their skin or shed their exuvia or just molt, they increase in size and they also take on a slightly more adult-like appearance. So in these larger nymphs up here, you can see the wing buds are starting to form on the back side or the dorsal surface of these avocado lace bug nymphs. And you can see on the smaller nymphs here, those lace, um, those wing buds are, are very small, almost undeveloped at this stage. And then when these large nymphs go through their final molt, they'll take on the adult coloration and their wings will be fully developed and that'll enable them to fly. So if you compare that life cycle to the life cycle of say the monarch butterfly, you have eggs, but then you have caterpillars which look nothing like the adult butterfly. So that is a whole own metabolist type of um, developmental cycle. And then those caterpillars will spin in up a pupil case or go into a chrysalis, and then they will undergo metamorphosis. And then when they hatch out, the adult form is very different to what the immature stages look like. But with lace bugs, it's just a steady progression of molting the skin. And each time you molt, you become more adult looking with each subsequent molt. So the life cycle is, is pretty straightforward. Um, these are some data that were published as part of a PhD thesis from um, a woman we were communicating with in Cuba way back in the day. She didn't really publish this in the scientific literature, but we managed to get a, a copy of her PhD thesis. So these temperature data are taken from work that she did. Here you can see the um, lace bug eggs. These eggs have not been covered with that tar-like material. You can see the operculum that's popped out and that allows the nymph to emerge. And interestingly, some of these eggs appear to have succumbed possibly to a, a entomopathogenic fungus. This fungus appears to be white, so maybe it's Bavaria bassiana. I'm not really sure. We, we didn't collect any of this material to analyze it. So those eggs will sit around for about 14 days at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 25 degrees Celsius. Then you'll have the nymphs, which feed on the undersides of the leaves. They'll be in the nymphal stage for approximately two weeks, more or less undergo their final molt, and then you have these yellow and black colored lace bug adults that you'll see underneath the leaves. And the adults are very distinctive. You don't even need a hand lens to see them. They're also the only avocado pest that has this distinct coloration. And they're also the only pests that are um, in the group Tingidae or you know these lace, common names are lace bugs. So the whole life cycle at about 25 degrees C is probably about a month, more or less. So some of the work that, that was done in Cuba suggests that eggs won't develop unless temperatures are higher than about 10 degrees Celsius or approximately 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If temperatures drop below those temperatures, then basically these insects shut down and they really don't do much development. Once temperatures creep up above 50 degrees Celsius, they can begin to accumulate enough uh, thermal units and that allows them to um, continue their development. So we could use these types of data to figure out how many generations a year we would expect avocado lace bug to have in California. What would be interesting would be to redo some of this work to figure out what the upper lethal temperatures are for avocado lace bug. It may be that during certain times of the year here, it gets very hot, obviously, and these heat waves may have a detrimental impact on avocado lace bug populations, perhaps something similar to what we see with Persea mite when the heat comes on and the mite populations just can't tolerate it and they seem to get incinerated and <laughs> basically you have thermal cleansing of the orchards. Here is the phenology data that we collected from San Diego. This work was done by Eduardo Humeres. He was a postdoc that Joe Morse and I uh, co-supervised. So you can see that during the April, May, June period of the year, the lace bug numbers are quite low. Then going into July up through August, populations really start to increase. And then as we move back into the fall, population numbers start to go down again. So if these phenology data are still being seen in San Diego County and possibly in the Fallbrook Oceanside Temecula area, we would be expecting to see avocado lace bug numbers beginning to creep up now. And I suspect that may be happening because I'm starting to get uh, emails and phone calls about this pest. So the populations may be increasing now and, and folks are beginning to notice them out in the orchards. But it would be really, I think, interesting, very useful to repeat these data, collecting um, 
exercises to see what's going on in these newly invaded areas, just to see if they're similar to what we observed in San Diego way back in 2004, 2005, 2006. Okay, so let's go into what we know about the distribution of avocado lacebug and what the presumed native range of this pest is. You remember way back on the first slide, the avocado lacebug was described from specimens that were originally collected from avocados in Florida, shown here back in uh, 1908. Lacebug has been recorded from parts of Louisiana, Texas, through the state of Veracruz here on the eastern side of Mexico. It's also in the Yucatan Peninsula. Records of it in Cuba. We know it's a big problem in the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. So these were the initial areas that avocado lacebug was reported from. The distribution of this insect was quite well known in these areas. And because the first specimen descriptions were made way back in 1908, it was just assumed that this Florida was probably part of the native range of avocado lacebug. And since Florida has a few species of native Lauraceae, it was just assumed that the lacebugs jumped off those native laurel plants and hopped onto avocados when they were being commercially planted in Florida. So this is the presumed native range of avocado lacebug. And when we started this work, we just assumed that everybody had been working on this had this part of the puzzle correct. But after we started doing some collecting and Paul Rugman Jones and Richard Stouthammer's lab starting to do, to do the molecular work of the samples that we were collecting from these areas, that story may have changed a little bit now. I'm gonna share the results of those um, analyses with you as we move forward from here. So part of what we wanted to do with the avocado lacebug invasion to San Diego County was to determine whether or not a biological control program would be needed. There were no known natural enemies attacking the eggs of avocado lacebug in California. And this suggested to us that perhaps a biological control agent that attacks the eggs of avocado lacebug might be a useful natural enemy for suppressing the pest in California. So as we started working on this, we did some literature reviews and looked at what had been published. And natural enemies are known from Florida. There are a couple of species of egg, egg parasitoids, this oligocetus species and this erythmalis species. A few generalist predators are known, like these predatory thrips, Frank Linothrips. We have one that's quite common in our avocado orchards, uh, Frank Linothrips uh, arisabensis. There's also another one that's quite common throughout parts of the Caribbean and Central America. That's Frank Linothrips vespiformis. There were reports that lacewing larvae would also feed on uh, adult and nymphal avocado lacebugs. And out of Florida, there were reports that predatory myrids and uh, coccinellids or ladybugs would also feed on uh, the mainly the uh, immature stages of avocado lacebug. Our work also out of Florida suggested that some entomopathogenic fungi attack uh, the, the eggs and maybe the nymphs and adults as well. And these fungi fell into two different genera, Boveria bassiana and Metarhizium anisoplae, which you're probably familiar with. But the big question here was, could these natural enemies actually suppress populations of avocado lacebug regularly, reliably, and hold them down at non-damaging levels? This work has not really been done properly, I don't think. There's been a thorough investigation to see whether or not these natural enemies have a true regulatory effect on avocado lacebug populations. So we got some funding from the Avocado Commission and Phil Phillips and I did the foreign exploration for avocado lacebug. And this was a two-pronged approach uh, to this, to this uh, foreign exploration program. So what we wanted to do, since we had um, a, a relationship, a good working relationship with Paul Rugman Jones and Richard Stouthammer, and the California Avocado Commission agreed that this would be an important thing to do, we undertook um, specimen collections throughout the presumed native range, that eastern part, southeastern part of the US, and then into the Caribbean and the northeastern part of Mexico, go out and collect material, Look for natural enemies while you're doing the collections, save some of the adults for molecular work. And then what we wanted to do with the material that we were collecting for these DNA analyses was to determine two things. Was avocado lacebug from all these different areas that we were collecting, it was a truly one species or were there several cryptic species in there? 
and they're all morphologically similar, very hard to identify based on morphology. So they were just all called avocado lacebug, even though they may be distinct species that were very hard to separate. And then the other part of the molecular work, it was designed to determine whether we could figure out where the California population had originated from in that area in which we were making the collections. So while we were collecting the adults for the uh, DNA work, we were also collecting eggs as well. And I was very interested in determining whether or not we could find egg parasitoids that could have potential for use against avocado lacebug in California. So this was one of the first problems that we ran into was that there were no keys available to identify egg parasitoids associated with lacebug eggs. Thankfully, Sergei Trapitsin in the museum here at UC Riverside is very good at these things. And this was an area that interested him. So he started working on uh, putting together a very large key that could identify the egg parasitoids associated with lacebug eggs. This meant a lot of descriptive work because a lot of these species had been read out by um, entomologists, but nobody had taken the time to look at those specimens or to describe them and give them names. So Sergey undertook that big project for us. So here we are, this is way, well, way back in 2006. Man, it's hard to believe that was 15 years ago. Um, I've got more hair there than I have now. Too. <laughs> so um, we're in Jamaica, uh, we're in backyards collecting uh, lace bugs and egg masses. Um, this guy here with his hands in his pants, he was a taxi driver. Basically, we just hired him for a couple of days to drive us around to all the people that he knew around Kingston and Port Royal, and he could get us into people's backyards where we were able to make the collections for the genotyping study and to collect egg masses for the um, uh, rearing of those egg parasitoids. Then when Phil and I moved out of Jamaica, we went through a few islands in uh, the Caribbean. We had some excellent cooperators in St. Thomas and there's Phil collecting uh, avocado lace bugs from an avocado tree. You can actually see some of the damage on the leaves here. After we went to St. Thomas, interestingly, we moved on to Barbados. At that time, avocado lace bug was not in Barbados, which really surprised me, which suggested to me at the time that perhaps avocado lace bug was still expanding its range through the Caribbean. And several years after we finished the survey work, sure enough, avocado lace bug showed up in Barbados and it became quite a significant avocado pest there. So that's an important clue about whether or not avocado lace bug was really native to the Caribbean. So one of the questions we wanted to answer from this molecular work was, you know, where on earth did California's avocado lace bug population come from? And given how widespread it is throughout the southeastern United States and all these islands in the Caribbean, is it really just one species? Or are there several species in there that we can't easily separate based on morphology? We refer to these as cryptic species, and therefore we just assume that they're all one species, but the molecular work strongly suggests that there are you know, significant DNA differences, which would allow you to break them out into different species, even though you can't tell them apart based on their morphology. So we gathered up a lot of material. We either went and collected it ourselves or we had cooperators send it in from, from different countries. So you can see here a map of uh, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean and South America. And listed here on the right-hand side are the different areas within countries or within regions within which we made avocado lace bug collections. So Phil and I, we spent a lot of time going through Mexico, very diligently collecting avocado lace bugs over a wide swath of Mexico, all the way from the Yucatan Peninsula, across here into Chiapas, then all the way up here into the uh, Nayarit region, where there is a significant Hass avocado production. Uh, when I was working on the avocado lace, uh, avocado seed moths, Denoma catanifa, there was a, a big orchard in a squintler which we did a lot of work and I managed to find avocado lace bugs down there too. And I think that was the first record for, for Guatemala. So we made collections out of there. We had cooperators down here in French Guiana that sent us material and Phil and I did a lot of collecting through the Caribbean all the way down into Trinidad. So all that material was passed on to Paul Rugman Jones in Richard Stouthammer's lab. He extracted the DNA, did the, did the uh, gross analyses looking at CO1 and then we ran some microsatellite analyses as well. So what did this molecular work reveal? 
So mito mitochondrial and the nuclear markers were used to pinpoint the geographic origin of the avocado lace bug population that invaded in California. And then we used microsatellites to sort of like drill down into that data to determine out of all that material we'd looked at, could we sort of use a molecular fingerprint to more accurately identify a source population based on the same fingerprint that we took from California populations. And this would give us an idea of just how closely related that they were. So the mitochondrial haplotypes that we, uh, that Paul generated indicated that California's population was related to specimens that were collected from Texas, uh, Guerrero, Chiapas, Tabasco, Nairi, Jalisco, and Michoacan, they're all in Mexico. But then if we use those microsatellites, we can refine our understanding of the genetic makeup of these populations. It's like fine tuning and drilling down into the data that you've got. And this was really quite an interesting result. Uh, California's lace bug population was most similar to species specimens that we collected in the state of Nayarit, which is on the uh, Western seaboard of, of Mexico. But amazingly, we got an almost you know, you, you see CSI and they put all this stuff into their, um, you know, DNA database codex or whatever it's called. And they get a hit. Oh, we got a hit. And it suggested to us, our hits at least, suggested to us that the avocado lace bug that invaded uh, California, at least in 2004 in the San Diego area, you know, uh, around National City and Chula Vista, probably er originated from Las Vivosas. And this is a, an area that's really popular with a lot of American tourists. It's part of what's referred to as the Mexican Riviera. And the molecular work also suggests that an avocado lace bug is one species. There's no evidence of cryptic species out of all the material that we collected. So that makes our job a little more easy because we can be pretty confident when we call avocado lace bug pseudic sister persiae, that's what it is. It's not a bunch of things masquerading under one name. Now, this is a really interesting photograph that I took. <laughs> so this is a small roadside stand where you can go and buy potted avocados. And it was just on the north side of a toll road where you come through, you pay your tolls, and you can just keep driving up the coast. Basically, you could drive up the coast all the way to um, Arizona or the bottom part of San Diego County. What I suspect happened is that somebody may have stopped here in their RV or car or whatever they were driving, a tourist maybe. They wanted to buy some Mexican avocados because man, they just had the best guacamole they'd ever eaten in, in Mexico. And they thought, well, why can't we just grow those trees here at home in our backyard? buy a couple of these, put them in the back of your car, drive them home, plant them in the garden, and you've just moved avocado lace bug from Las Vivosas and Nayarit to National City in San Diego County. And I know some of these plants were infested because they made collections from, from them. So that's maybe why our genetic match was quite strong. So what else did the molecular work reveal? So just to go back to what we found out, California source population probably came from around this region, Las Vivosas and Nayarit. Then it was moved 1,300 miles north into San Diego, and that invasion occurred in 2004. And that's the RV hypothesis. We've got no evidence to support that, but it seems like it could happen. Now, all of the material that we sampled down here along the western coast of Mexico had huge levels of genetic diversity. And when we compared those levels of diversity to the Eastern populations that we collected from say Veracruz, Yucatan, Florida, and then parts of the Caribbean, the genetic diversity in this Eastern um, set of collections was much, much reduced. And there were two possible explanations for this. The presumed native range here of the Southeastern United States, the Caribbean and possibly Eastern Mexico, Maybe it's not the native range of it, part of the native range of avocado lace bug after all. Maybe it's an invasive pest in this region. That may explain why it's continuing to spread through the Caribbean and subsequently moved into Bay Bar Barbados, which was an island that uh, island nation in the Caribbean that we did not originally find lace bug, but invaded a few years after we had sampled through that area. It also was suggested that maybe the sort of 
reduction of genetic diversity could be an adaptation to high humidity conditions, but we, but we really don't know. So we, are sus we suspect, we have a suspicion that maybe this Eastern population is really not part of the native range of avocado lacebug due to low levels of genetic variation, but these Western populations that we collect from Mexico have very high levels of um, genetic variation, which would suggest that this may be an evolutionary area of origin for this pest. So I thought those results were really interesting, fascinating stuff. So is this what happened in 2017? Because what we, and I'll get to this in a minute, the DNA work for these new populations that have shown up in the Temecula, Fallbrook, Bonswell and Culver City area have a haplotype that's more similar to these Eastern lacebug populations. And the most parsimonious explanation for that is that maybe somehow avocado lacebug moved out of Florida and was accidentally introduced for a second time into Southern California. And uh, some of that original work that we did was published by Paul back in 2012 if you're interested in tracking down that publication. So what's been going on since we did this work? Well, there was a recent paper that was published in 2019 and uh, some entomologists in Nayarit in Mexico decided to go through uh, 30 avocado orchards, which were located in Jalisco. We collected from Sun Blas and in the Tepic area as well. So some of our material that we used in molecular analyses were collected from these general areas. I think Phil and I went to Lisco as well. So 30 orchards were sampled by the Mexican guys back in 2016. They only did it once. This was one month in July. They sampled several varieties, Hass avocados, and these two other varieties that I'm not familiar with, Hall, and I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Choquet or Choquete. I'm not familiar with those avocado varieties. And 20 of the 30 orchards, or about 66% of them, were infested with avocado lacebug. It's possible that the other 10 were managed intensively with insecticides. They really don't mention a reason for why a third of them were pretty clean. So they collected eggs, 8,681 eggs, collected over 2,000 nymphs, and about 500 adult lacebugs were collected from these surveys. And they're really interested in looking for natural enemies that were associated with these three different life stages. So they did find some egg parasitoids. They're all in the family Trichogrammatidae. However, out of the 8,681 eggs that they collected, only 61 of those eggs produced parasitoids, which is about a 1% or so rate of parasitism, which is not, not very high at all. Several predators were found in association with these uh, lacebug infestations, Stethrus, Cyclonida, and this Pentilia species. We found about 56 coccinellids associated with avocado lacebugs. And then the fungi were found attacking adult lacebugs, Bavaria bassiana and Metarizium anisopla as well. So about 58 adults that were field collected succumbed to fungal infections, which was subsequently identified as Bavaria or Metarizium. There's one thing to remember about Nyarit, it's an extremely humid area. So fungi probably have the potential to do quite well there. In comparison to California, we're extremely xeric. We have low humidity and our environmental conditions just aren't really favorable for the development of epizootics of these entomopathogenic fungi. So after reading this paper, I was sort of left like, well, you know, what, what do these results re really mean? We, we, they went out and collected a whole bunch of eggs, nymphs and adults. They only did it once that was, you know, for a couple of weeks in July. So do these results suggest that avocado lacebug, is it really under poor biological control? Well, yeah, maybe it is. Or because they only sampled one month, you know, was this the best time to actually go and do these surveys? Should they have extended those surveys over a longer period of time? Should they maybe have done it for a whole year to get a better idea of, of what is going on? So again, this comes back to just, not really answering this question as to how important are natural enemies in regulating populations, at least within the native range of avocado lacebug. More work needs to be done there to better answer that question. So avocado lacebug, well, it's, uh, it's continuing to move. It's now invaded Hawaii. 29th of December, 2019, lacebug was found infesting avocados in Pearl City on the island of Oahu, also in the urban garden center in Oahu. 
It's also now being detected on the eastern part of Hawaii Island. So what's really interesting about this, and this again would be a fascinating molecular study would be, you know, what population has come into Hawaii? Is it part of the genetically diverse Mexican population, like the Las Vivosas um, population that we found on the western seaboard of, of Mexico? Or is it this uh, eastern variety of avocado lace bug that has come into uh, Hawaii? Did the invading population come from you know, one of these two sources in California? Or was it a direct introduction out of the, say, out of Florida? Or is it possible that the avocado lace bug that's in Hawaii has come from somewhere else? So molecular studies could really help answer that question. My suspicion is that California's probably exported one of these two uh, avocado lace bug varieties or um, genotypes into Hawaii. Hawaii and California have a nice symbiotic relationship like this. We seem to trade a lot of pests <laughs> back and forth with each other just because of our proximity, tourism, and, and the movement of goods and services back and forth. So did we find any natural enemies out of all of that work that Phil and I did? We collected thousands of eggs, brought them back into the quarantine facility. The eggs were collected throughout Mexico and the Caribbean. We had our permits from the USDA, APHIS, to bring them back. We read nothing. No parasitoids came from any of the eggs that we collected. And when we found avocado lace bug populations, they were really large and extremely damaging. Again. We, Phil and I were there just for a couple of days. Whether or not this is the real situation year round that they're always in these outbreak modes, we really don't know. And there just isn't a lot of year round phenology work published on the lace bug. We really don't know how these populations cycle throughout the year and whether or not natural enemy associations change during the course of the year, maybe respond to increasing and decreasing avocado lace bug populations in these areas that populations are potentially native. We still don't know the answers to those questions. But uh, when we did find natural enemies, generalist predators were quite common, especially these Frank Linothrip species. This is an adult female here. She mimics an ant. And the larvae have these bright red abdomens. And then you can see here the uh, metathoracic segment is also slightly orange, reddy, reddy colored as well. And it's been hypothesized that this may be warning coloration to keep other predators away from eating these uh, predatory thrips larvae. But in the Dominican Republic, Frank Linothrips vespiformis, extremely common when lace bug densities were high. And same in Esquintler in Guatemala. It's mass. I've never seen such high numbers of these predators on avocados. And they were always in pretty, pretty good numbers when uh, avocado lace bug was in high density on these avocados in Esquintler. We have one species of Frank Linothrips that's already present in California. It's Frank Linothrips rizabensis. It's probably native to California. And it is a, a natural enemy that will respond to outbreaks of uh, avocado thrips, skirto thrips, persiae. So commercially available natural enemies. So uh, Eduardo Humeras, the postdoc that Joe Morse and I supervised, looked at these. He set up some studies to figure out whether or not different types of uh, natural enemies that you could buy commercially would have potential for controlling uh, avocado lace bugs in avocado trees. So he ran these laboratory studies and at the time, Frank Linothrips rizabensis was commercially available and we'd been helping Jake Blem with uh, Buena Vista and sectories up in Ventura develop a rearing system for this predator. It's pretty straightforward to rear. And sure enough, this predatory thrips would feed a lot on small nymphs and would attack median nymphs at a lesser rate and it would um, not attack adult lace bugs. When we looked at the commercially available um, lacewing larvae, I think it was Chrysoperla carnei that we used, the uh, larvae of these lacewings would feed on small nymphs, medium-sized nymphs, and they would also attack adults, and that sort of confirmed what we had observed in the field. There were predatory mites that you could buy. Neosulis californicus is a very good natural enemy of Persea mite. It will invade the nests and feed on the eggs and the small nymphs. Unfortunately, this predatory mite Interestingly, almost we saw no evidence of attack on first instar lace bug nymphs, and it would attack second instars or these smaller sized nymphs at very low levels. What we should have done was expose the eggs of avocado lace bug to this predatory mite, and we didn't do that in those studies. 
So Chrysoperla, uh, I was Rufolabris, sorry, um, consumed all life stages. Frank Lino th preferred small nymphs and really Niulus, Niulus, uh, Neosiulus, God, what's wrong with me? Neosiulus californicus was not really effective against late spike nymphs. And as I mentioned, we didn't test it against the eggs either. So the second part of the work that uh, Eduardo was doing for us was looking at some uh, insecticides that you can use in avocados for their efficacy against avocado lace bugs. And the way we did this work was we would go out, spray um, leaves on trees, then harvest the leaves after preset intervals, and then expose lace bugs to those residues that were of varying ages. And you can see there's two sets of graphs here. And we'll just look at the residual impact of the insecticides in avocado lace bug. And you can see that carbaryl was very effective for up to 112 days, you're still getting 100% mortality of avocado lace bugs. Midacloprid was very good too. Its uh, toxicity or potency seemed to increase after about 28 days. This was probably because it took time for the material to be absorbed up out of the soil and into the leaves. Uh, Abamectin in oil, spinosad in oil and petroleum oil were not very effective against avocado lace bugs and phenopothrin was, uh, was, was pretty good as well. So what came out of this work was insecticides that we thought would be effective against avocado lace bug, especially spinosad and abamectin, did not show very good efficacy against this pest, and therefore their use for controlling populations of avocado lace bug are not um, recommended. So then we looked at some contact insecticides, and these pyrethrins seem to be the most effective. And we suspect that this would, might be a good um, organic option as well. I think pyrethrins are organically approved for use in avocado orchards. So based on some of that earlier work that we did with imidacloprid, uh, Frank Byrne, just down the hall from me here in, the, in Chapman Hall, we had a collaborative project with him where we were looking at different rates of application of imidacloprid to small and large trees. And you can see in this graph here that applies. So, the, so small trees were defined as being only three to four meters tall, about six years of age. These large trees were about nine to 12 meters tall. And they were probably around 25 years of age when the applications were made. And these insecticides were applied as soil drenches that were made in March. Oh, no, no it was, I think it was through fertigation. Yeah. And it was uh, through March or June. So then we would, after it set, weeks after the application of the soil into the soil would go and pick the leaves bring them back to the lab put lace bugs on them and see what the levels of mortality were so you can see that for small avocado trees at these application rates of 280 grams per hectare or 560 grams double the rate it was pretty quick uptake so that by about the fourth week we're getting close to 100 percent mortality of avocado lace bugs at both rates then after about uh, 18 weeks or so, treatment efficacy dropped a little bit, and then it just continued to decline until we were about 40 weeks out. With those larger trees that were about 25 years old and probably nine to 12 meters tall, it took quite a while for the insecticide to be drawn up into the tree. It took about 16 weeks or so for the material to get up. And then once it was in the tree, it sort of, I guess the, the impact or the strength of that treatment broke pretty quickly. So by about week 24 through 40, you're only getting around 40% mortality. That's still pretty good though. So, but yeah, the treatments didn't seem to last as long in the bigger trees and the uptake rate was much slower, but overall imidacloprid seemed to be able to provide some level of control of avocado lace bug. And it may be a good option if you're considering uh, needing to treat trees for uh, this pest. Okay, so I think that pretty much wraps it up for what I have to share with you on avocado lace bug. If you want any more information, we do have a web page up on avocado lace bug, and you can go to um, www.biocontrol.ucr.edu. That's my lab's biocontrol uh, website. And uh, UC ANR has a, one of their very nice IPM pages up, and you can also look for information on avocado lace bug biology and control there as well. Um, okay, and so with that, we can go to the questions, and we have a few. Um, the first question is from Casey. Uh, the question is, what is the furthest north avocado lace bug has been found as of 2021? Right, yeah, good question. So far, it doesn't appear to have escaped out of LA County. 
uh, late last year. Oh, and actually, it was, I guess, well, yeah, it might have been late last year or maybe just before COVID shut everything down. Tim Spann was doing some, um, he's with the California Avocado Commission. He was looking up around San Luis Obispo because the commission has some training farms up there and uh, they haven't found it up in that area. So as far as we are aware at this stage, it seems still to be probably in the greater Los Angeles area. But if anybody sees it, please would love to update those maps. You know, if you see it in Santa Barbara, Ventura, you know, up in San Luis Obispo, please, please let us know because we'd definitely like to check that out and get a better idea of where this lace bug may be spreading into. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Bob. Um, do these bugs have a leaf preference, as such as do they prefer young, old leaves or any other kind of leaf? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And I should have put that in my talk. Yeah, they seem to go after the more mature leaves. So, you know, when avocado leaves are quite young, they've got that nice bronzy color to it. And then they go into that very light green phase and they're still kind of soft and floppy. You don't see lace bugs feeding on those leaves, but once they harden off a bit, then the lace bugs tend to move on to them. So yeah, they prefer the more mature hardened off leaves as opposed to the younger, younger leaves. Yeah, it's a great question. I should, I'll update my talk on that. Thank you. Actually, Excellent. I'll make a note so I don't forget to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is from Jacob. The, uh, he's asking, are, do the lace bugs spread any diseases? Yeah, I don't think they actively spread any, um, any plant pathogens around. I think the plant pathogens that get into the leaves are opportunistic pathogens and they they exploit those feeding wounds that the lace bug, larve, uh, lace bug nymphs and adults make. But again, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's looked at that. You know, maybe they carry those uh, colilito trichum spores on their bodies and maybe they have some sort of symbiotic relationship between the fungus and the lace bug adults. So, because that damage, it's, you always see it with uh, avocado lace bug feeding. You know, you get that that window of complete necrosis within that bronzed out area. So maybe there is some relationship between those particular species of, uh, you know, fungi and, um, and avocado lace bug. So yeah, it's, it's possible. I, I, I don't think we know. I don't think anybody's looked at that. Okay. Um, there's also a question from Ben. How damaging are avocado lace bugs to other laurels in Florida? Yeah, so uh, Jorge Pena's looked at that, and it seems that those native laurels are tolerant to mild levels of damage, but when you compare the damage to what you see on avocados, avocados seem to suffer quite a bit higher levels of damage. Okay, we also have a question asking, are there any climate or things like a full moon that causes them to migrate? Right. Um, that's really interesting. You know, like a lot of these bug problems that we deal with, uh, just to throw one out there, you know, we're dealing with South American palm weevil right now. They fly, but we don't know what motivates them to fly. And, um, you know, we've done some lab tests on the South American palm weevil and they can fly really long distances. But in San Diego, they've barely moved. They've been there since, you know, 2014 or so. So it's the same thing with lace bug. They've got wings, they can probably fly. I've never seen one fly. And if they do fly, you know, what motivates them to take off? And if they do take off, can they fly fairly long distances on their own? Or are they just jumping from leaf to leaf, branch to branch, maybe tree to tree? Or do they just fly up into the air, get caught by the wind and get blown long distances? And you know, maybe they end up three quarters of a mile away. We don't know. Nobody's uh, looked at that either. <laughs> more, more questions, more questions. I get my new PhD thesis. I'm writing all these down. <laughs> Plenty of work to do. <laughs> all right, thank you. The next question is, um, Long Beach and the surrounding area have almost total coverage on mature avocado trees in the urban environment. Is this common throughout Southern California or are there specific areas you found uh, more hot spots than others? Yeah, so that's another good question. I uh, can't answer that because we've done no systematic surveys to, to figure, figure that out. Yeah, that's something that we, we could do, but it would take a lot of time and money. And this is uh, something that we could really rely on with citizen scientists. 
and you've just made me think of I should check iNaturalist <laughs> to see if people are posting avocado lace bug finds in new areas. So yeah, systematic surveys like that, very expensive, time consuming, relying on uh, community scientists to get out there and post stuff on iNaturalist or send me photographs is one way that we can fill in relatively fast and cheaply, uh, I guess, delineate really the infested region of California that has avocado lace bug. So I know there's a lot of people listening. If you see anything, think it's avocado lace bug, please just snap a photo of it with it on your phone and then just uh, email it to me and um, we'll check it out. Great, thank you. We have a question from Greg asking, do avocado lace bugs overwinter on the ground below trees? <sighs> <Don't know. laughs> Good question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, they may, or they may uh, simply just keep moving around on the foliage that's on the tree. But there are times there, as you know, when the avocados drop a lot of leaves. And if the avocado lace bugs are on those leaves, they're probably going to fall with them. Do they drop to the ground at that stage or do they know that that time of year is coming up and they just start moving into new areas of the canopy and start sitting and feeding on leaves that are less likely to drop? Don't know. <laughs> Another question for my PhD thesis. <laughs> Until there's still much research to be done. Yeah, there's heaps to do on this lace bug. Um, okay, so the next question is from Karina asking, can you share management recommendations for residential, uh, not commercial avocado trees suspected to have um, avocado lace bug? Yeah, so um, you can buy at, you know, the big box stores, some of these systemic insecticides that we have demonstrated to be effective and they can be applied as soil drenches. And I think you can also buy some of these pyrethrins that you can spray onto the trees as well. My understanding from talking to some of the growers down in the Fallbrook Oceanside area is that avocado lace bugs pretty easy to kill with contact insecticides, stuff that you can probably buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever you go to get your gardening supplies. But the critical issue there is going to be coverage, especially getting up underneath the leaves where those nymphs and adults are feeding. So you'd need a pretty good uh, backpack sprayer to get up underneath those leaves and make sure you get pretty good coverage on the undersides of those leaves. The other thing to do is you'd be wanting to treat your trees probably before you start seeing all of those brown necrotic leaves showing up because by the time that stuff shows up, you're probably getting towards the end of the season. So you need to be checking your trees fairly regularly and then trying to hit those populations when they're probably small and not causing so much damage to the leaves. Okay. Uh, we have a, another question asking, is there a general threshold level to treat on small to large trees? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> These are great questions. We, we don't know. We don't know what the action threshold is for avocado lace bug. But my experience with other bugs tells me is that some people have almost zero tolerance for leaf feeding damage and other people have really high tolerance for leaf feeding damage. So uh, one thing you might want to do is, if this is a concern, you might just want to start checking your trees every week or every other week. And if you're seeing lace bugs and you're seeing the populations creep up and you're beginning to see levels of damage that you personally are feeling uncomfortable with, then maybe that would be a good indicator that at least for you, based on your personal preferences, that might be a, you know, the time to start considering treatments if that's what you want to do. But now these are great questions. We this. Like I said at the beginning of this talk, it's a well-known pest that's spread over vast areas of avocado-producing uh, regions. We know so little about it. Okay, so the next few questions are kind of related um, regarding where lace bug has been identified and, and cited. Um, the questions are, have there been any reports of sightings in this season in the Bonsall, Fallbrook, Temecula areas? If so, what are the whereabouts? And then there's another question that says, does avocado lace bug go to the California Bay? Oh, um, right. I think you've touched on this a little bit in a previous question, but if you want to um, restate that, that would be- Yeah, so let's start with California Bay Laurel. It's a beautiful tree. And um, I, I'm worried that this type of insect could get into California Bay Laurel and cause problems. but. We haven't tested that. And that would be a really interesting project to do would be to get some potted bay laurels, 
put avocado lace bug on them and see whether or not it can feed on them and how much damage it can do and whether or not it can reproduce on that plant. Uh, with respect to uh, where is uh, avocado lace bug and fallbrook bonzel in Oceanside? Um, I haven't been tracking the spread of those uh, insects in that area. We have no funding to do that. I've just been relying on PCAs or growers just to contact me. And one of the, I, and it's not really a problem, but there's a high bias in that personal communication because it's the same guys that call me up or email me somewhat regularly, just updating me on areas that we know where the pests already are. But um, yeah, we haven't been really doing a very good job at trying to figure out just how far spread through those areas avocado lace bug is. But you know, it's something that we could do through a community scientist effort and just posting stuff on iNaturalist or sending me photographs that you take on your phone and we can start building out a map. You know what, I should even put on our website maybe, report finds like we've done for South American palm weevil. I mean, I'll write that down as another job for me to do. Okay, we have one question left in the chat. Um, and the question is, was the emitted cloprid soil drench selected because of the feeding habit on the underside of the leaves and are foliar sprays less effective? Right, so um, yes, it was um, chosen because of its systemic properties and we knew it could get into the leaves. Uh, Frank Byrne has also developed very sensitive assays to figure out how much material is actually in the leaf. And then based on that, we were able to figure out what the concentrations within the leaf need to be to get avocado lace bug kill. So that's really well figured out for imidacloprid, and that's one of the reasons we chose that product. And plus it's used in avocado orchards. I think it's pretty sure it's registered for use. So there's a history of using imidacloprid in these orchards for control of avocado pests, and lace bug was another one that we, we wanted to look at. So with respect to these contact insecticides, um, some of the work that we did, and I showed you in that graph, contacts work pretty well. Um, Carbaryl was one that we tested and it had uh, leaf residual activity, I think for was it over a hundred and something days. I'm just going back to, whoops, have a look at it now. Yeah, Carbaryl, where was it? Blue, yeah, 112 days, we're still getting, you know, um, pretty much a hundred percent activity. And then, yeah, that the other one was uh, phenopatherin as well. We were getting kill right up to for 77 days. We're still at over 90%. And then the pyrethrins that we tested here in this graph. Oh, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? Yes, yeah, so the pyrethrins are also pretty good. And those were contact insecticides as well. Okay. Well, that is all of our questions. Thank you, Mark, so much for-, for Oh, pleasure. Sitting. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. And if you need anything else, just drop me a line. All right. Have a good evening, everybody.